Okay, everybody. Thank you again for coming. This is Mr. Zawacki with Hillsborough Virtual School. And today, what we're going to be talking about is the continuation or the second half of challenging concepts of the biology EOC. Starting with this. Anytime you see the word replication, that just simply means making a copy of it. So this explains the steps on how DNA replicates or makes a copy of itself. This is something you guys are going to need to memorize as well, at least with the names of the enzymes that do these jobs. Step one, the enzyme helicase unzips the strands of DNA, just like a zipper. Remember how DNA is two-stranded? Well, helicase unzips it in half. Then the next enzyme, DNA polymerase, will base pair some strands. A, which is adenine, will always pair with P, thymine, and vice versa. Guanine will always pair with cytosine, and vice versa. Remember how helicase unzipped DNA in two different strands? Well, there are the two strands have names. One is called the leading strand, which is done continuously. That's why it's called the leading strand. And the lagging strand is the other one. Those are done in pieces. And those pieces are called Okazaki fragments. Finally, those pieces need glued together to look like the leading strand. And they are glued together by a third enzyme called ligase. Your final product, two new strands of DNA. So again, helicase is the enzyme that unzips it. DNA polymerase base pairs everything in two different strands, leading and lagging. The leading strand is done in one piece. Lagging is done in several pieces called Okazaki fragments. And then finally, those pieces, those fragments, are glued together by ligase. The final thing, two new strands of DNA are made. Here's a picture of the same exact thing that I talked about. So this is nothing new. This just shows you on a visual what it's supposed to look like. Remember what I said about helicase? It unzips the DNA. Then you have DNA polymerase base pairing everything. Remember how T goes with A. A goes with T. G goes with C. C goes with G. Okay? So DNA polymerase will base pair. Leading strand all in one piece. Lagging strand double in several pieces. Remember, those pieces are called Okazaki fragments, but they are glued together by ligase. That's it for DNA replication. That's what you need to know as a biology student. Helicase is the enzyme that unzips it. DNA polymerase base pairs everything together. Leading strand is done in one piece. Lagging strand is done in several pieces called Okazaki fragments which are finally glued together by ligase. The other part, which is close to DNA replication, but don't get confused with it. DNA replication is just DNA making a copy of itself. Transcription and translation all deal with making proteins. If you ever see the word synthesis, that's all that means, making something. So protein synthesis means protein making. And there are two steps on how this happens. Transcription is part one. Translation is part two. So this is part one. Part one. Part one is where DNA turns into or creates messenger RNA inside the nucleus. It's very similar to the first steps of replication. Helicase unzips it, just like replication, but instead of DNA polymerase base pairing everything, RNA polymerase base pairs everything. And it's similar. Remember how I said C to G? That's the same. G to C, that's the same. T 
to the A, that's the same, but this one, A to U, is the only different one. U is called uracil, and that is only coded by RNA polymerase. So again, DNA unzips itself. RNA polymerase then makes a strand, just one, not two, but it makes a strand of RNA, messenger RNA. That's part one right there. The only thing you need to know about transcription is that the purpose of it is to make messenger RNA. It's done by helicase unzipping DNA and then RNA polymerase base pairing. That's what transcription is. So when you have that RNA, messenger RNA code, it's now time to use that code in translation. So this is part two, translation. So remember, going back to part one, remember this thing I circled down here in the bottom? That's the messenger RNA that was created during transcription. Here it is again on the bottom. So this is the messenger RNA on the bottom. And during translation, it sounds just like the word. The goal is to translate the messenger RNA. And a ribosome does it. A ribosome will read the messenger RNA three letters at a time, such as CGG. tRNA, which is this person over here, tRNA will then transfer the amino acid that goes with it. <clears throat> so if CGG stands for arginine, well, the tRNA will use the anticodon, which is GCC, to go get arginine. So now you have your first amino acid. Then the ribosome will continue to the next three. It'll read CUU. Oh, that means leucine. So now the tRNA will bring leucine. The next one is AAG. Well, now that stands for lysine. So the tRNA will get lysine. And then CGG, which stands for arginine, and so forth, tyrosine. So as you see, the point of translation is for the messenger RNA to get translated. A ribosome translates it. The tRNA will transfer the amino acids that pair up with those three letters. And this all happens in the cytoplasm. So going back, just a little bit of backtracking here, transcription and translation both are to make protein. But think of it like part one and part two. Part one, you're starting with DNA, but you're making messenger RNA, the code. The first goal for transcription is to make the code. RNA polymerase does that. The second step, translation, now you're supposed to translate the code. A ribosome does that. The tRNA will bring the amino acids that pair up with the specific three letters of the code. Remember how we talked a little bit yesterday about protein structures? So when you get these five amino acids in a row, they kind of start to look like this, right? This is a primary structure. This is the very basics of what a protein can look like. That's a very, very archaic or old or very, you know, um, primary structure. But it could get more complex. And then it can turn into a spiral helix or maybe a pleated sheet, that is your secondary structure, a little more complex, more amino acids. Or it could become even more complex and turn into a globular structure. That's a tertiary structure. Or it could become the most complex protein, the biggest, heaviest, massive protein called a quaternary structure, which is actually four tertiary structures put together. 
So we already talked about that briefly yesterday, but this is a better visual that I wanted to show you. Just understand that proteins can be very simple, like a primary structure, or they can become very complex into secondary, tertiary, or quaternary structures. How are proteins made? Right here, transcription, where you make the code, and then translation, where you translate the code to make the protein. Remember, you're translating it three letters at a time. Each three letters represents an amino acid. And then once those amino acids are together, forming by polypeptide chains, they can then form into the proteins that they're supposed to be. That's how we make proteins for our body. All right, this is where I want you to use the box, the little letter A box above my name um, and above your names. So just choose what you think is correct. This is a poll, A, B, C, or D. What is the role of DNA ligase in the elongation of the lagging strand during DNA replication? Sounds like a lot of crazy words, but let's look at it. What's ligase supposed to do, A, B, C, or D? Give you guys about 10 more seconds. So there's 64 of you in here. We got about 40 answers. Okay. It looks like the majority of us are selecting C. And that is correct. Remember, ligase joins the Okazaki fragments together. Showing you again. Right here, number four. Okazaki fragments are glued together by ligase. So answer C is the correct answer. Good job for those of you who, who picked that out um, without just, you know, selecting it because of the majority. But yes, Okazaki fragments are joined together by ligase. Be careful reading these types of questions. Sometimes they want you to, like, they want to trick you with fancy wording and stuff like that. Just look at the basics. And, and then start, you know, you should be able to figure it out if you know exactly what it's supposed to do. All right, another question for you. In the process of transcription, what happens? A, B, C, or D? What happens during transcription? A little bit trickier. What do you guys think? Remember, transcription. What's the purpose of transcription? Part one of transcription translation. Okay, we got mixed answers here. It's okay. Doesn't matter if you're wrong today. Give you guys about 10 more seconds to guess. Okay, let's go over this. Remember, transcription and translation together make proteins. So this one A would be right if it said in the process of transcription and translation, what happens? Well, yeah, proteins are synthesized. But transcription, that's only part one. So the protein is not made yet. DNA replicated? No. Remember, that's just DNA replication. So we don't make another copy of DNA during transcription. So now we're stuck here. Is it MRA, mRNA attaches to the ribosomes where RNA is made, synthesized? Well, if we go back two slides during translation, here is where the ribosome attaches to the messenger RNA. That's translation. So that one's not going to work. But RNA, messenger RNA, is synthesized. That was correct. So those of you who had C from the beginning, great job. Transcription is supposed to make the messenger RNA. Translation is when the mRNA attaches to the ribosomes and the proteins are made. 
So this is translation. This one's translation. This one is just DNA replication. So yes, RNA is synthesized. And one more. According to the central dogma, all that means is, like, what's the main idea? What molecule should go in the blank? So I'm going to start from back here. So it should go DNA, then turns into what? Then turns into the protein. So what's the step in between DNA and protein? A, B, C, or D? This one seems to be a little bit easier. Give you guys about 10 more seconds. Okay. So, yeah, we did hear about tRNA and mRNA. So those are your 50-50s at least. We never talked about mount DNA, so that's not an answer. rRNA is a thing. That's just the ribosome, and that does not, it's not a main player. That's just something that reads. Um, that messenger RNA. So it's down to mRNA or tRNA. And the answer is, well, DNA is a code, and it's going to make another code to read the protein. And that code is messenger RNA. So good job for those of you who have A as your answer for that one. It should go DNA, and then transcription makes messenger RNA, and then the protein is made finally. All right, switching gears. That was DNA replication, transcription, and translation. Next up is evolution. And evolution is, is one of my favorites. Um, it just simply means species change over time. That's it. Every single species on Earth, whether it's a plant, a bacteria, a human, a skunk, you name it. Every single species on Earth will change and adapt over time. And there's evidence behind it. It's not just an idea. It's just a theory. And if you guys know what a theory is, that's something that has been proven and tested thousands of times with evidence that supports it. That's why it's called the theory of evolution. And the evidence is in these five things below. DNA similarities, embryology, similar structures with different functions, fossil evidence, and vestigial structures. All of those are proof that evolution and species do change over time. I will show you the evidence in pictures. Here we go. In terms of DNA, if you look here, a human and a mouse, not even, not even a chimpanzee, a human and a mouse have over 90% the same DNA. Remember, our DNA is made up of A, C, Gs, and Ts, adenine, cytosine, guanine, thymine, and it's like billions of letters long. And out of all those letters, the mouse and the human are 90% the same. The chimpanzee with the human is 99.5% the same. 995 out of 1,000 letters are the same. If you compare us to a palm tree, we're still 50% the same or more. So all living things, not just things that look like us, but all living things share common DNA. Also here, when we were an embryo, um, an embryo is something that's developing before it's born. When we were an embryo, about eight months before we were born, we looked like this. But guess what? So did a pig. So did a reptile. So did a bird. So do fish. Embryos at the beginning all look very, very similar. It's very hard to tell the difference. Also, <clears throat> different structures or similar structures with different functions we have the same exact number of bones, muscles, and tendons in our arm and hand as a cat does in a paw, as a whale has in its flipper, or as a bat has in a wing. 
yeah, a bat flies with that, and a cat walks with an arm or its paw, and a whale swims with its flipper, and we use our hands for different things. So that's a different function, but they're all very similar structures. Another proof of evolution is vestigial structures. How can you prove something has changed over time? By looking at the bones that it has that it doesn't use anymore. If you look at a skeleton of a whale today, it has leg bones. It does not have legs, but it has leg bones. Same thing with humans. We have a tailbone, but no tail. We have an appendix, but do not use it as an organ anymore. So there's many different things that we have even, and other animals have, that they use, or that they used to use, but do not anymore. These are all evidences that, A, tell us species change over time, and B, we're all closely related. So we probably used to be the same thing, but over time, we adapted and changed into our own species. And that's what evolution is all about. Another word that goes with evolution is natural selection. And that word, it's just one way on how evolution can occur. So remember how evolution is species changing over time? Natural selection is one way on how species can change over time. So to give you an example, look here. In step one, we have one species of mouse. They're just a couple different colors. There's a tan colored mouse and a gray colored mouse. Well, that bird of prey likes to eat mice. So it's going to pick off as much mice as it can in step two. And if you're looking at that, it's eating a lot more tan mice than gray mice, probably because they're easier to catch and easier to see. Well, that leads to something, though. Over time, you're going to see more and more gray mice because they're better adapted. They can hide. They can be more camouflage. And you're going to see less and less tan mice, which means because they're getting picked off more. They, they don't have an advantage. So the version of the species <clears throat> that has an advantage, part of adaptation, allows that species to adapt and evolve for the better. That's called natural selection. If you ever want to forget what natural selection is, just visualize this picture with the mice. Remember, there's two different varieties of one species of mouse. One has an advantage over the other. Because of that, that species will become more and more prevalent, whereas the other version will go extinct or not be existing anymore. That happens naturally in nature all the time. <clears throat> okay, and then switching gears to a little bit similar but different, um, classification. When animals are organized, remember we have to, there's, billion, there's millions of animals um, all around the earth. And scientists need some way to organize them in, in order to put them in different categories. And that's what classification is. There are two main classification ways. There's a Linnaean taxonomy chart, which organizes things based off of physical characteristics. If they look the same, they're going to be in a similar category. And it goes all the way from domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. All these animals on the bottom, um, the, the, the large cats and the dog and the wolf and the polar bear and the black bear, they're all of the same kingdom. <clears throat> they're all the same phylum. They're all the same class. They're all the same order. Family, though, is when they start to split up. Those seven animals are in three different families. Those seven animals are in four different genuses. And the species are their own specific species. So that's how the Linnaean taxonomy chart works. There's only six kingdoms in the entire world, but there are millions of species that you see on the bottom. The other way to organize animals is called the cladogram, or using cladistics or phylogeny to organize animals. 
Remember how the Linnaean taxonomy chart organizes things based off of just looking physically similar? Well, the cladogram organizes it based off of evolutionary characteristics. This one focuses on not only what's similar, but also what came first in its fossil record. So at the bottom is the common ancestor that all of these species, insects, fish, amphibians, ferns, um, simians, humans, th these are the species that all came from this common ancestor on the bottom. And then once these different clades came about or derived traits like vertebrae, well, then you have everything above it is a vertebrate. Tetrapod, everything above it is a tetrapod. Amniotic egg, everything above that is, has amniotic eggs. Hair, bipedal. So these are the characteristics or derived traits that these animals picked up that separated them off on their own specific clade. So what you need to know about cladograms they just organize things based off of evolution, and they're organized from oldest over here all the way to most recent on the fossil record to the right. All right, A, B, C, or D, guys. It says individuals. Oh, this is a, actually a tricky question, um, but if you were here yesterday, you might be able to get this one. Individuals within a species tend to be genetically different. So the primary mechanism generating this individual variability is what? So in other words, which one of those processes makes species genetically different? I'll give you a hint. You want to think what process prepares cells to reproduce through sexual reproduction? That's going to give you the answer, because that, well, that's what makes things genetically different. So I'll give you guys 10 seconds. And if you were here yesterday, you'd probably definitely know this. It looks like we got this one. Yes, it is meiosis. Remember, mitosis is where cells like our skin cells make another copy. That has nothing to do with being genetically different. Where you get genetically different is with meiosis. Meiosis creates cells that are 23 chromosomes instead of 46. And when that 23 chromosomes fuses with another cell with 23 chromosomes, that's going to create genetically different individuals. That's why you are not an exact copy of your mom or dad. You're genetically different from both. You're a combination of it that's made because of meiosis. All right? So let's try another one. All right. So only the, the correct answer is the, the only one that's absolutely correct from this statement. So marine mammals have many structural characteristics in common with fish. We know that. The explanation that evolutionary theory would give for the similarity is what? So think about it. A, B, C, or D. So why are marine mammals, why do they have many structural characteristics in common with fish? Why? And that's going to give you your answer. A, B, C, D. Or E. Sorry, I had to reset it. So if you're put an answer, go ahead. A, B, C, D, or E. We got some mixed answers here. Give you guys about 10 more seconds. 
looks like we're thinking about B. It looks like we're thinking about E. About five more seconds. Okay. So we can eliminate some. Um, fish and mammals are closely related. Well, they are related, but they're not that close. There's many things in between them. Marine mammals evolved directly from the fish? No, not directly, no. Marine mammals never developed the use of limbs? We know that's false as well. So B or E, fish evolved structures similar to those already existing in mammals? or marine mammals adapted to an environment similar to that of the fish? Well, let's think about that. Fish evolved structures similar to those already existing in mammals. Fish came first, so they wouldn't have evolved things after the mammals. That's what makes that incorrect. The answer is E. Marine mammals and fish, they both adapted to the ocean that they live in. They live in it together. So they both adapted, and that's why they have similar structural characteristics. So that would be E. Good job for those of you who had it. Okay. So now we're switching gears to plants. Way different than what we were just talking about. But anyways, there are four types of plants on Earth, only four. Bryophytes are the oldest, they're the smallest, they have no vascular system, and those are your mosses. Mosses look like little carpets almost that are out there in nature. Pterophytes are the ferns. We know what a fern looks like, Think like Jurassic World. Anyways, pterophytes have a vascular system, which means like a xylem and a phloem to help the plant grow tall and it reproduces by spores. Gymnosperms are your non-flowering plants or trees, like pine trees, for example. They're larger, they have a vascular system, they also have a woody tissue, like bark. That's, that's what a woody tissue pretty much is. And the angiosperms are the youngest in terms of evolution. They're also the most diverse in terms of evolution. And these are all plants with flowers or fruit. So anything with flowers or fruit will be angiosperms. That's it. You can go outside and choose any plant in the entire world. It's going to be one of these four types. Bryophytes are the oldest evolutionary things. Mosses were the first plant to ever land or ever colonize on land. Ferns came next. Gymnosperms came third. Angiosperms came last, however, they're the best, so they're the most numerous. Here they are again, bryophytes, pteridophytes, gymnosperms, angiosperms. Um, and here's some differences as well. A couple things you want to look at, remember fruits and flowers, the only ones that have that are angiosperms. Um, water required for fertilization. The first two need water to fertilize. That makes sense in evolution, right? Because they came from green algae in the ocean. But gymnosperms and angiosperms, they don't need water to fertilize. So they just release pollen in the air. That's how they work. Seeds are another one. Um, there are no seeds in mosses or ferns. Gymnosperms, you start to see them in the cone. Angiosperms, you definitely see them in fruit. Pollen, remember, instead of spores, mosses and ferns have spores. Gymnosperms and angiosperms have pollen. So as you can see here, you just note on how evolution changed the mosses and evolved all the way to the angiosperms. These four plants still exist today, though, because these four plants each have their own habitat and area where they can still thrive. Okay, these are angiosperms. Remember, angiosperms are flowering plants. 
So this is a close-up of an angiosperm diagram. And a couple things you need to know for the test. You need to know the male part and the female part of the flower. I hope you knew that. There is actually, each flower has a male structure and a female structure. The male structure is right here. And that is called a stamen. Stamen, M-E-N, so that will give you a hint that it's the male structure. Stamen is made up of the anther and the filament and pollen that it releases. The center of a flower is the female part. So think center of the flower is the female part. And that is called the pistil or carpal. Depends on what book you're looking at. But it's pistil or carpal, which contains the stigma, style, and the ovary. So pistil is the female part. Stamen is the male part. Pistil contains the stigma style ovary. Male stamen contains the anther, filament, and pollen. Now, when pollen is released in the air, pollen wants to eventually find its way into the pistil. And if pollen finds its way into the pistil, that's called pollination. Then that pollen will open up and release its cell into the ovary. And if that happens, if pollen fertilizes an ovary inside a flower, then you're going to get a seed or a fruit containing seed. And that's the beginning of the next generation. So if the pollen and the ovary are on the same flower, that's asexual reproduction. That's just one flower making another copy of itself. But if the pollen goes somewhere else and reproduces with another flower, that's sexual reproduction. Because that's two different flowers creating another one. So again, with flowers, guys, know the pistil is the female part and know the stamen is the male part. Know that the stamen releases pollen and it's supposed to fertilize the ovary. When pollen fertilizes the ovary, it's going to create a seed or a fruit containing seeds, which is the beginning of the next plant. All right, we just went over this. Let's see how we were paying attention. In the male part of the plant, the stamen is made up of what? A, B, C, or D, or E. So the stamen, I think we know that. Yep, it is definitely the anther and the filament. Stigma style, that's female. Filament stigma, that's actually male and female. Anther stigma, that's also male female. So yes, filament and anther. Good job. What about this one? The female pistil has three parts, including all of the following except. So the female pistil contains the stigma, style, and ovary. So the only one that it does not contain is D, the stamen, because that's the male part of the flower. Good job there. All right, switching gears one more time. I don't know when you guys learned about this this year, but for my Hillsboro Virtual Kids, this was the last thing that we learned about. And these are the different systems of the human body. So first of all, the nervous system is pretty much your brain, spinal cord, and all the nerves that go with it. Well, they divided that even further. The brain and the spinal cord make up the central nervous system. All the other nerves, sensory and motor neurons, make up the peripheral nervous system. 
sensory neurons go from the body to the brain and spinal cord. Motor neurons go from the brain and spinal cord back out to the rest of the body. So it's like a whole repetitive thing. Like you touch a hot stove, the sensory neuron will go from your finger to the brain saying, hey, you just touched the hot stove. Your brain will say, that hurts. you got to move your finger away. So then it'll tell the motor neuron to go back to the finger and say, hey, move your finger away. It's burning your finger. And that's exactly what happens. It's a relay of nerves to do things. This all happens, obviously, in like a split second, quicker than even that. You should also know the four lobes of the brain. So if your eyeball was right here, or somewhere close to there, frontal lobe is in front. That controls speech and emotion and thought and thinking. Parietal lobe is right on top. This controls breathing, heart rate, um, you know, coordination sometimes. Occipital lobe is in the back of your head. That actually connects to your eyes for eyesight. And the temporal lobe near your ears helps with, you got it, hearing. So just make sure you also know the four lobes, where they're at and what they control, and know the difference between the central and peripheral nervous systems. Central is your brain and spinal cord. Peripheral is everything else, sensory and motor neurons that race around the body. This one is, I would say, is a pretty important one, the circulatory system. If you understand the circulatory system, um, at least the basics, you should be good to go for that. First step, <coughs> red blood cells. Red blood cells are very important. They're made in bone marrow. So if you were to look inside of one of your bones, that's where your red blood cells are made. And once they're made, they go into the bloodstream. And they have a job. Their job is to carry oxygen everywhere to deliver it to your cells. And they are going to pick up the oxygen in your lungs. So in the lungs is where your red blood cells will pick up oxygen. And then they'll go to your heart, which will pump them out around the body. And they do that so they can deliver the oxygen so that your cells, all trillion of them, can make ATP, energy, for yourself. Remember cellular respiration that we learned about yesterday? Well, in order to do cellular respiration, you've got to have glucose and oxygen. Your red blood cells are responsible for bringing oxygen to your cells. So that's where the whole thing comes in. Red blood cells carry oxygen to your cells to make energy. When they're done making energy, they'll even take back your carbon dioxide waste, which is poison for you, and they'll take it all the way back to your lungs so you can breathe it out. That's why you breathe in oxygen, give it to your red blood cells, and then the same red blood cells will give your carbon dioxide back to you so you can breathe it out. And it does that so you can make energy, ATP, in all of your cells. A couple other little things, <clears throat> arteries versus veins versus capillaries. Capillaries are all the little blood vessels that carry blood, you know, to, to the little extreme parts of your body. Arteries and veins are big blood vessels. Arteries are the red that you see. Red is going to be oxygen-rich blood. Veins are going to be oxygen-poor blood. Arteries go away from the heart. Veins go to the heart. So again, arteries carry blood away from the heart. Veins carry blood to the heart. <clears throat> and here we go again. Same exact thing. I'm just showing you a different picture of it. When blood comes into your heart, it first enters the right atrium as oxygen-poor blood. Veins bring it in. Then your blood will go into the right ventricle. Then your blood will get pumped out of your heart, actually, 
and go to your lungs. That's where your blood changes from oxygen poor to oxygen rich. Then it'll enter again in the left atrium this time, going then into the left ventricle, and then finally being pumped out the aorta, the largest artery in the body that carries blood out to the rest of the entire body. So let me explain that again. <clears throat> when blood is oxygen poor, it has to go back to your lungs to get more oxygen. First place it goes is veins, then your right atrium, then your right ventricle, then the lungs, then the left atrium, then the left ventricle, and then finally out the aorta to the rest of the body. One exception to the rule, though, arteries will always carry blood away from the heart. Veins will always carry blood back to the heart. But arteries are always oxygen-rich except for the pulmonary artery. So this artery right here that goes from the heart to the lungs, that's the only artery in the entire body that's oxygen poor. And vice versa, the vein, the pulmonary vein that goes back to the heart here is the only vein in the body that is oxygen rich. So 99% of the time, Arteries are oxygen-rich, carrying blood away from the heart. Same thing with veins. They're 99% of the time oxygen-poor, carrying blood to the heart. But the pulmonary vein and the pulmonary artery are the only exceptions. The artery, pulmonary artery, has oxygen-poor blood, and the pulmonary vein has oxygen-rich blood. That's the only exception to the rule. Okay? Another system to learn about quickly, because it's not, we only went over it briefly, is the digestive system. <clears throat> it's pretty cool. You should definitely know the path of the digestive system from chewing food in your mouth, going down the esophagus, and then into your stomach where it's broken down further, and then into your small intestine. and then into your large intestine, and then is stored as waste in the rectum before it leaves the body out the anus. So just be aware of this path, because that's what your food and drinks do on a, on a daily basis. But also know what some of the organs do along the way. The small intestine absorbs all your nutrients. If it wasn't for your small intestine, you would not get any nutrients. That's where you get healthy. Your large intestine absorbs all your water. That's where you get hydrated. Your stomach and mouth are very similar. They just break down food. And your esophagus does this weird thing called peristalsis, which when you swallow food, you actually can have, you can actually swallow food upside down or drinks upside down. Go ahead and try it. Um, it's peristalsis is the muscle-like contraction pushes food and drink into your stomach. That's why we can eat and drink in outer space or upside down if necessary. So again, know the pathway, mouth, pharynx, I forgot about that one, that's your throat, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum, anus, but also know the organs and what they do along the way. Remember, absorption of water for the large intestine, absorption of nutrients for the small intestine. All right, one more system to look over. This was the last lesson for our Hillsboro Virtual Kids, and we learned about the immune system. And one big thing you've got to get from that system is that we know that it's the system that protects us from getting sick. But we should also know that there are two different ways our body can defend itself. There's a non-specific way, like your skin or mucus or hair defending itself. Does your skin, mucus, or hair 
know what germ is trying to enter your body? No, it just blocks it. It just kills it in general. That's why it's nonspecific. But specific are your white blood cells, your T cells and B cells, because they will recognize, they will not only recognize it, but kill the pathogen and remember how to kill it for the future. Every single person should have vaccines in their life. What a vaccine is, guys, is something to trigger this specific response. When you get a vaccine, they actually give you a shot of a little bit of the virus, believe it or not. But they do that on purpose. So your white blood cells will find it, they'll fight it off very easily, and they'll remember how to fight it off for the future. That's why if you ever get that virus again in your body, like the real deal, your white blood cells already know what it is, and they'll kill it, and you will never get sick from it. That's the purpose of a vaccine, to trigger a specific response. Nonspecific, again, just your skin or mucus, defending stuff in general. But specific with your white blood cells, those are the ones that learn, and they defend and, and understand what they're fighting against. All right, <clears throat> last question. Let's see who's paying attention from the circulatory system. Which of the following contains oxygenated blood? A, B, C, D, or E? This is a tricky one, so I wouldn't go with the majority. I'd pick what you think is right. The majority could be right, but I think what you think is right. A, B, C, D, or E. Give you guys about 10 more seconds. All right, so first of all, I'm going to eliminate D and E. It is one of those three answers. So the right atrium, if we go back, the right atrium and the right ventricle, the right side of the heart, I know it looks like the left, huh? But if, if it's on you, it's, it's, it's the right side. That's, what they, that's why it's called the right atrium and right ventricle. But no, the right side of your heart is all oxygen poor. So it's not the right atrium. Remember how I said arteries always go away from the heart and 99% of the time it's oxygen rich. Veins go to the heart. 99% of the time it's oxygen poor. The only exception is the pulmonary artery and vein. The pulmonary artery is the only artery that has deoxygenated blood. The pulmonary vein is the only vein in the body that has oxygenated blood. So that answer is C. All right, guys. That marks the end of – oh, I got one more question. Sorry, one more question. So A, B, C, or D, which of the following is – true. There's going to be one word that's incorrect on all of these, except for one. So A, B, C, D, or E, which one is true? Okay, I've got about 10 more seconds. Looks like we got two solid 
potential answers here, B and D. Give you guys about five more seconds to lock in your answer. Well, we know it's not C or E. White blood cells fight infection. They do not carry oxygen. So we know it's A, B, or D. Well, red blood cells do not do anything with photosynthesis. That's plants. So it's definitely not A. So we are right. It is B or D somewhere. So what, what the, the difference is right here. Red blood cells carry oxygen from the alveoli, or do they carry oxygen from the bronchial tube? Both are part of the respiratory system, too. So that's, this is a tricky question because they both carry oxygen to do cellular respiration. But where they get them from is B, the alveoli of your lungs. The alveoli are tiny microscopic sacs in your lungs that transfer carbon dioxide and oxygen. So the alveoli does that. The bronchial tubes is too far up. Um, your, your red blood cells don't go that high up in your respiratory system. But that's a good guess if you had D. But it is B, the alveoli of your lungs. If you got all of those questions right, I'm sure you can probably do pretty good on the, on the exam. If you missed a few, it's not a big deal. You guys have uh, still time to prepare and study for this. But I hope this entire session today and yesterday helped you guys out. I'm going to open up the chat box if you guys have any questions or would like to say anything. Um, so you can feel free to, to answer or tell me anything you need to or questions or things you might want to revisit. Um, but I will stop the recording now. And thank you guys again for coming. And um, I hope this helped you out for your test for the EOC that is coming up.